And you're watching Morning Live. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, today marks 42 years since the death of Bantubonke Stephen Biko. And he died from injuries sustained during beatings and torture at the hands of the apartheid security police. And decades after his death, we look at how far South Africa has come in tackling challenges of poverty and unemployment in uh, this democratic dispensation. <clears throat> and given that Biko was such a strong proponent of black consciousness, it would have been interesting to know, you know, how perhaps someone like Biko and his views that we can take into account now uh, would have advised the South Africa uh, currently going forward. And uh, Tando uh, Sipuye is a program officer at the Steve Biko Foundation to talk to us about the legacy of Biko and also where we find ourselves today. Tando, good to see you again. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start first, uh, the 42nd anniversary of the death of Abantu Bonke, Stephen Biko. Uh, do you think that we have done enough as a nation to actually, one, make sure that we remember those heroes who were killed by that brutal establishment that used to rule this country? And number two, do you think enough is taught about these heroes in our current dispensation? I think that um, more can be done in terms of honoring and celebrating our heroes and our heroines um, in the liberation struggle. And I think that certainly our approach thus far has usually been uh, partisan uh, because we only approach our history and narrative only from particular uh, political trajectories, but also whenever we tell our story, we always single out this uh, great superman. And so we always tend to focus on individuals rather than the collective. But in looking at the history of the struggle, you know that um, it was a collective effort. It was people, ordinary people on the ground, who sacrificed their lives um, for, the, for the liberation struggle. So I think that certainly more can be done in celebrating our heroes and our heroines than what we're doing currently. And looking at Biko and you know, what he stood for, the relevance of black consciousness today. You know, black consciousness um, will remain relevant for as long as we still have um, the kind of power relations that we have in this country. For as long as white supremacy and racism persists, black consciousness will be relevant because the philosophy of black consciousness was a response to a particular condition, and that condition was the oppression of black people uh, by white people and the system of uh, racism. And uh, when we look at South Africa today, we see that uh, South Africa is still a criminal settler colony and that these racist uh, patterns still continue. Our society is still characterized by racialism. You still know that largely black people who are poor uh, people who are marginalized and ostracized in society are black people. People who are stuck in townships are black people. People who are domestic workers in this country, uh, garden boys and so forth, are largely black people. So the system of racism is still deeply entrenched in South Africa and it still has not been uprooted. So the legacy of black consciousness will persist for as long as racism, white supremacy continues to persist. So, and, and, and perhaps a bit controversial, but why is it then that black consciousness is struggling to actually uproot you know um, uh, the, 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 these racist uh, sentiments and elements especially within black people first and foremost and I'm not saying they're racist I'm talking about uh, the mentality that keeps black people enslaved why are we struggling as black people to take on um, you know black consciousness and use that to propel ourselves I think that um, the problem starts first and foremost um, with our institutions, um, the institutions of power and authority, that uh, we have not used the philosophy of black consciousness or even pan-Africanism for that matter, you know, in terms of policy and informing our policy in this country. We have not used uh, Biko's ideas in terms of trying to deal with some of the critical challenges that are facing our nation. But more than that also, what has happened after 1994 is that black consciousness has shifted from being a grassroots formation, a, a grassroots movement which is amongst the people down in the community, influencing their livelihood on a daily basis, trying to change their material conditions into being a political party, political parties. And so 
this renders it irrelevant because it cannot articulate uh, the material conditions of black people under this uh, uh, current system that we are living in. Mm. And then, and 42 years since his death, uh, one of the things and uh, in your recent paper, you say that there are serious contestations around the legacy of uh, Biko. Talk to us about that. Um, well, there's been various contestations around Biko since time immemorial, since when he was still alive. I mean, uh, Biko, um, various people and various groups have claimed Biko uh, for various purposes, at, you know, for whatever ends. But also you would remember that uh, there was a time when Biko was accused uh, by some people of having been a CIA agent at some stage. But recently we have had a particular narrative being pushed uh, with the recent uh, book that was published by Peter Dutoit, uh, Stellenbosch Mafia, in which a claim is made that Steve Biko had some kind of a relationship with uh, Johan Rupert. Uh, but also Johan Rupert made this claim last year also during a Power FM interview with Given Mkari. And uh, so this uh, is a lie that is being perpetuated here. And what I was saying uh, in the article that I wrote is that um, Actually, this claim by Johann Rupert and Peter Dutoit in his book, and by the way, Peter Dutoit did not do any due diligence in terms of interrogating uh, this claim by Johann Rupert. For example, there is a Steve Biko Foundation that is in existence. It, it houses a Steve Biko archive. There is a whole Steve Biko family that is there. There is a whole Azapo that is still currently existing. But Peter Dutoit, I know for a fact that he did not do any research or try and verify whether or not Biko in fact did have a relationship um, uh, with Johan Rupert. This was clarified last year during a black consciousness reunion by three of Biko's uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Mampele Rampele, Dr. Malus Mpumlwana, as well as um, Mamamu Janku Kumbi. They clarified and said that uh, Johan Rupert had no relationship at all with uh, Steve Biko and they actually gave the circumstances around this alleged meeting. It was a meeting that took place at Stellenbosch University. It was a meeting of SASO, NUSAS and the Afrikaner, Afrikaner student bond, the student wing of the Afrikaner brother bond at the time. And um, really what Dr. Mampele said is that Johan Rupert was a small Anyana boy at that time. There was absolutely no conversations that took place between him and Biko, and this is a lie. And he uses this to justify his white privilege. Well, unfortunately, we have to end it on that note. But, of course, I have no doubt we'll hear a lot more about the man, Bantu Wonke, Stephen Biko, throughout the day today, as it marks 42 years since his uh, brutal death under the hands of the apartheid security police. And uh, thank you so much to Tando Sipuye, who is the program officer of the Steve Biko Foundation, talking to us about his legacy 42 years since that brutal assassination.